it has been a really excellent session since morning and i thank the chief of the army camp dr shrinivas who has made us uh, sit on and keep us alert by making us stand and uh, then sit down well he has a meaning to all this because uh, vestibular system is something which has not been dealt at all probably in the medical college days and it takes time to understand all the intricacies of this vestibular anatomy the physiology and all these things well he has a purpose behind all these things and by tomorrow evening we will definitely have pearls of wisdom to be taken from him and the other delegate other faculty members i come from a small place in maharashtra called dhure it is north of shirdi and nasik i started my neurotological career 10 years ago i took my initial training from dr anirban biswas and i have been interacting and going along with so many of my faculty members to various workshops and conferences and i am still a student of neurotology uh, i have been given a topic that is tumarkin's autolithic crisis and dr shrinivas mentioned right now how important it is to understand for all of us because as we become audio vestibular physicians or specialist in the near future we would be dealing with patients who come to us with sudden episodes of drop attacks when they come for some analysis and then treatment about uh, let me begin my presentation well this was a famous clip which most of us have seen it is from the movie what i go by alfred hitchcock so we begin the presentation on this uh, drop attacks well the drop attacks which specifically as a vestibular specialist we need to know about is about the tumarkin's autolithic crisis these uh, drop attacks are also described vividly as sudden falls without any warning when it happens because of a vestibular origin they are because of the erroneous signals which happen from the saccule let us see how a typical drop attack looks like it occurs instantaneously it's without any warning it is without any loss of consciousness it lasts for a minute or less it is not associated with any autonomic symptoms like nausea pallor sweating and it's generally without sensation of spinning the patient can immediately get up and resume his activity only if the individual suffers serious bodily injury the outcome will differ rarely it can be morbid or fatal due to head injuries before 1936 if you go through the pages of literature not much has been mentioned about drop attacks being attributed to the vestibular system or the origin being from the vestibular system earlier it was felt it was probably because of brain stem ischemia or vertebro basilar insufficiency and these were the remarks made in the previous literature but this gentleman alex jumakin being a british otologist in 1936 proposed autolithic autolithic vestibular end organ malfunction as a cause of drop attack in patients of end stage meniere's disease he called these drop attacks the autolithic catastrophe the 
the diagnostic criteria which needs to be applied to label a patient of being of Tumakin's autolithic crisis, we naturally have to understand the historical part, the, the examination part and the investigation part. In the history, we definitely will come to all the presenting features a person will have that will give us an idea whether the person has got a Meniere's disease. We all are aware of the triad of Meniere's that is tinnitus, hearing loss and vertigo. So naturally you will have a patient who will be giving you a history of the repeated episodes of vertigo which he has been facing over the last few years. Maybe the literature also mentions a person to have a drop attack because of uh, mean years. He will be having mean years for at least a few years, maybe around five years or so. So it will be an end stage endolymphatic high drops. The sudden drop attack without warning while standing still not induced by motion would be the history. There will be no aura. There won't be any postictal signs which you see in a patient of epilepsy. There it, will, it will not be associated with any loss of consciousness except associated with a head injury if a person gets when he develops, when he has a drop attack. There won't be any perioral numbness, there won't be any tingling, double or blurred vision, there won't be any occipital headache which all will, all these uh, symptoms will to give us an idea there is a neurological involvement. What do we expect in physical findings when we see a patient who complains of a drop attack? Essentially, we will have to go through a thorough neurological examination and the neurological examination will have to conduct all the tests for the cranial nerves, we will have to see for the motor system, we will have to see for the sensory system and essentially it would be normal. We will be definitely having some hearing loss when we test the patient, it can be unilateral or bilateral. We will be able to see a unidirectional gaze nystagmus in these patients. We come to specific neurotological examination. We have already described and seen since morning how we go through the vestibular ocular and vestibular spinal system. We have seen about how to test the smooth pursuit, the saccades and these can be seen in our clinical setup by through the video frenzels or frenzels glasses. We can go through the head impulse test with the help of the VHIT machine. In the, for the neurotological examination, we need to test for the vestibular spinal system. And we have seen just in the previous lecture how to test the vestibular spinal system. We have these various tests at our disposal, at our disposal to see how it uh, works. We have the Rombergs, the Fukudas and the Antebergers test, which all will suggest about the unilateral vestibulopathy. Further, we investigate these patients. The Important investigation we will have to do is the audiometry which will clearly give us an idea whether the person has got a unilateral or a bilateral hearing loss. Further we go to electronystagmography or the video nystagmography where the caloric test will either be normal or show a reduced response. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral depending on the stage the person who is having the menias comes to us. It is essential, some residual function is usually demonstrated in the affected ear. We have two more uh, faculties which can give us an idea. WEMS certainly help us in diagnosing these patients of drop attacks because we will definitely have a low amplitude WEMP in a patient of mean years, more so in such patients who have got a drop attacks, certainly there will be a low amplitude uh, when seen, the subjective visual vertical may not be of much use as it takes care of the utricular pathologies. Since morning we have seen an excellent anatomical and physiological facts. It is just to give you a revision of what has been said in the morning. We have two types of motion sensors. The semicircular canals will deal with the angular acceleration and the utricular and sac will take care of the linear acceleration. 
we have seen this neuronal connections, connections between the vestibular ocular and the vestibular spinal tracts. What actually goes wrong in a patient of mean years so that he develops these drop attacks? We need to have some considerations in mind before we think of what a drop, drop attack would look like. The cupuli and maculi are pressure sensitive. Well, we have seen that in the morning in an excellent presentation by Dr. Srinivas. In normal condition, the vestibular system gives inputs about the gravity vertical. Any abnormality in the vestibular fluid and changes in electrolytes can lead to endolymphatic hydrops. This is the fact we know about Menier's disease and constant and sudden changes in endolymphatic fluid pressure can cause inappropriate stimuli to either sensors in cupola or macula or both. Taking into consideration all these facts, this is actually proposed by Tumakin what actually happens during a drop attack. There is sudden endolymphatic pressure change. This will lead to vestibular stimulation this will lead to disequilibrium, inappropriate automatic reflex muscle movement will happen and it removes the body support platform which is provided by the feet. Gravity pulls the individual to the floor before visual and proprioceptive impulses recognize, assess and correct and this is proposed explanation of Tumarkin's autolithic crisis induced falls. Well, if an individual of endolymphatic hydrops has to develop an autolithic crisis, some vestibular function must be preserved. If it is a completely dead organ, there is less chance or no chance of a TOC happening in this person. What we have been using over the years is a caloric test to assess the activity in the labyrinth and this caloric test will always give you an indication whether there is a hypoactivity or uh, hyperactivity. Over the years, there have been presentations and uh, literature is supporting some patients of uh, Timarkin's autolithic crisis who have undergone vestibular deafferentation. This confirms the peripheral vestibular cause of these attacks. This is what we mentioned in the beginning, in the earlier stages, brainstem ischemia due to meniers was considered as a cause of drop attacks. Well, once we have diagnosed the patient with drop attack which is secondary to meniers or it is a Tumarkin's autolithic crisis, we have options how to treat these patients. The first option would naturally be medical treatment. Vestibular suppressants have been asked to be given by the people who have been dealing with these cases and it has to be given on a prolonged duration. This is one of the indications when you will have to give vestibular suppressants for a prolonged time. Literature also mentions about injection fentanyl which we have been using during uh, the anesthesia and this has been given once or twice a week in patients to be treated for Tumarkin's autolithic crisis. Intratympanic steroids as we give in patients of menias, intratympanic gentamicin also has been recommended and if none of these medical therapies work, we have the option of surgery and probably we will have some more insight into what type of surgical treatment can be offered in tomorrow's lecture. The surgical treatment can be either vestibular nerve section or labyrinthectomy. This can be decided looking at the facts. If the hearing is conserved, naturally we will have to go for the vestibular nerve section, but the hearing is hampered and it is almost a dead ear, then we can think of labyrinthectomy. So that was a glimpse into an attack of a Timarkin's autolithic crisis. It definitely becomes imperative on our part to understand whether this person of drop attack is because of Timarkin's autolithic crisis and we will have to go through various causes of drop attacks, common as being the cardiac arrhythmias, the hypotension, vertebrobasilar insufficiency, some types of epilepsy may present with drop attacks, multiple sclerosis, 
drug induced motor disturbances and to add to these causes we have so many other causes with spinal deformities, deformities in the joints of the lower extremities and many other causes which can lead to drop attacks. Symptoms of blurring vision, diplopia, perioral numbness, transient loss of memory, aura, warning, loss of consciousness, all are features of drop attacks due to neurological causes. Just a small video to give us an idea how an epileptic drop attack may look like. Attacks me, I just feel an aura. That's, uh, I feel some bitterness in my throat. And when I just feel like that, I just go sit down on a safe place where there are no things that can hurt me. I just forget everything. I just lose consciousness completely. And but after some while, a while, that's around three, four, five minutes, I just get back to normal. When I start getting back to normal, I just feel dizzy, well tired, slowly. I just come to normal but with no clear vision, with no clear sight, that is. There's, but slowly I just sit down. After a while, for around, uh, after around 10, 20 minutes, just come to normal completely. Keep. So there is a definite dif difference between the two attacks. One is with an aura, one is without an aura and you can clearly make out how immediately a person rises after Tumakin's autolithic crisis. So I conclude by saying Tumakin's autolithic crisis is caused by inappropriate stimulation of the autolithic receptors in saccule in patients suffering from endolymphatic hydrops. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>